you, Louise. So we're um, just coming to the end of our series that uh, we've been doing for a, a while on, um, on the book of James, and today looking at uh, chapter, chapter 5. So as I was preparing this talk, I came across a quote from um, a third century theologian from North Africa called Cyprini. And this is what he said. He said, beloved brethren, we are philosophers, not of words, but of deeds. We exhibit our wisdom, not by dress, but by our truth. We know virtues by their practice rather than their boasting of them. We do not speak great things, but we live them. Now, isn't that a great summary of the book of James? You know, all, all that he's saying there of the different things, but we don't speak great things, we live them. That the book of James is all about, it's a living faith, it's how it affects our lives and the way we live our lives. Our thoughts, our actions, our relationships, but not just all those aspects, also how we pray. James addresses many different places that we might find ourselves in. You know, Simon read a bit of James at the beginning of our service saying that, you know, whether we find ourselves in trouble, whether we find ourselves in a place where things are going well, when we're happy, that we need to still to, to respond to God in prayer, in praise. Whether we're sick, whether we're aware of the fact that we've messed it up yet again in some aspect of, aspect of our lives, when we're aware of the fact that we have sinned. And often we as Christians, I don't know whether you've thought about this, but I think often we as Christians can expect life to, um, to be easy. We can expect things to go well. We can expect um, that, that our life is somehow going to be different than people whose lives are, um, around us who aren't Christians, how their lives are going. And I think that our expectations can be a stumbling block to us that our expectations can be the thing that, that we trip, trip up on because we somehow feel that, that God has failed us. But Jesus actually tells the disciples, he says this in John 16, verse 33, he says, I've told you these things. So before that, he's been telling them lots of things before that in this chapter. He's saying them, that they need to stay connected to him in the vine. He's been telling them of his love for them, how much he loves them. He's been telling them that the world hated him first and that the world is going to hate us as well. He's been telling them how he's going to send his Holy Spirit. And he says, ask in my name. So he says, I've told you these things so that you in me may have peace. In this world, you will have trouble, but take heart. I have overcome the world. And I've loved that verse over these last months. <laughs> You know, take heart, I have overcome the world. We know that Jesus is still in charge, that God is still in charge. Take heart. So today we're going to be focusing on praying with real faith. So let's pray now and ask God that, that he would speak to us this morning, that he would encourage us in how we pray. So Lord God, we thank you that we can take heart, that we can rely on you. Father, I ask you now to open our hearts and our minds. Enable us to hear what it is that you want to say to us. Father, spur us on, take us deeper. Come, Holy Spirit, we just welcome you amongst us. We welcome you in us, in our church, and in us as individuals. We want more of you. Encourage us in our prayer life. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. So as Louise read that chapter to us so brilliantly, that whole chapter um, in James, the last chapter of the book, chapter 5, just reminds us again and again how we need to be patient, to be patient until Jesus returns. You know, we don't know how long that's going to be. We don't even know how long our, our lives are going to be here on earth. But to be patient, encouraging us to grow in patience that amidst whatever challenges may get thrown to us, whatever our circumstances in life, to be patient and to go on, no matter what we're facing, whether we're facing injustice, whether we're in the midst of a pandemic, whatever it might be, to be patient. It reminds us how, if you think about the farmer and his crops, how he has to be patient and has to wait. And patience is rooted in the very character of God. 
You know, I think it's perfectly seen if we look at Jesus and, and think about Jesus' life. What do we see in Jesus? We see his patience. We see how Jesus kept a low profile. How Jesus wasn't easily offended. You know, how he bore reproach. How Jesus would eat at anybody's table. You know, and that could be a challenge for us. You know, who we welcome into our home or who we mix with. That Jesus ate at anybody's table. That Jesus rejected violence, that he rejected revenge. I came across um, a couple of weeks ago an amazing blog by someone who goes by the, the name Nightbird. I don't know if any of you came across um, her when she was on um, America's Got Talent a few weeks ago, but her, her blog that she wrote or writes is incredible. You can see her patience as she's going through incredible challenge in her life and pain in her life, but as she's going through it with God. So I'm going to read you some of this blog, and she, she starts the section that, that, that was the section I read and that struck me, saying, God is on the bathroom floor. God is on the bathroom floor. She says, I don't remember most of um, the autumn because I lost my mind late in the summer, and for a long time after that, I wasn't in my body. After the doctor told me I was dying, and after the man I married said he didn't love me anymore, my brain caught up with it all, and something broke. I spent three months propped against the wall. On nights that I could not sleep, I laid in the tub like an insect, staring at my reflection in the shower knob. The bathroom floor became my place to hide, where I could scream, where I could be ugly where I could sob and spit and eventually doze off, happy to be asleep. Even with my head down on the toilet, there were times when I wonder what I must have done to deserve such a story. I fear sometimes that when I die and meet God face to face that he will say I disappointed him or offended him or failed him. Maybe he'll say I just never learned the lesson or that I wasn't grateful enough. But one thing I know for sure is that he can never say he didn't know me. I am God's downstairs neighbor, banging on the ceiling with a broomstick. I show up at his door every day, sometimes with songs, sometimes with curses, sometimes with apologies, gifts, questions, demands. Tears have become the only prayer I know. Call me bitter if you want to, that's fair. Count me among the angry, the cynical, the offended, the hardened, but count me among the friends of God. For I have seen him in rare form. I felt his exhale, laid in his shadow, squinted to read the message he wrote for me in the grout. And he wrote, I'm sad too. I've heard it said that some people can see God because can't see God because they won't look low enough. And it's true. Look lower. He's on the bathroom floor. And I just want to show you a, a clip from America's Got Talent because I just think she just shines with her faith in God and in him being there with her. And she, she's written this song that she sings called It's Okay. So we're just, just going to have a quick clip from that. All right. And who are you here with? I'm here by myself. It's okay. <laughs> <laughs> and what do you do for a living? Um, I have not been working for quite a few years. I've been dealing with cancer. Oh, sorry. Uh, <laughs> no, it's okay. Okay. Yeah, I'm okay. All right. Can, can I ask you a question? How are you now? Uh, last time I checked, I had some cancer in my lungs, my spine, and my liver. Wow. So you're not okay? Uh, well, not in every way, no. You got a beautiful smile and a beautiful glow, mm -hmm. and nobody would know. Thank you. It's important that uh, everyone knows I'm so much more than the bad things that yes. happen to me. Yes. Yes. All right. It's okay. It's okay. It's okay. It's okay. If you're lost, we're all a little lost, and it's all right. It's okay. It's okay. It's okay. It's okay. If you're lost, we're all a little lost, and it's all right. It's all right to be lost sometimes. Wow.
your voice is stunning. Mm-hmm. It is. Absolutely stunning. And I, I totally agree with what Howie said, you know, about authenticity. There was something about that song after the way you just almost casually told us what you're going through and, oh, you know. <laughs> you can't wait until life isn't hard anymore before you decide to be happy. Um, there are, however, there have been some great singers this year. Um, and I'm not going to give you a yes. I'm going to give you something else. Amazing, isn't it? See her, her patience, her fighting through, going through with God. But as she said, every day she turned up with God, that God would still know her. He was her friend. And she'd seen God responding to her, speaking to her there in her pain, saying, I'm sad too. So I wonder how patient you think you've been in praying with faith for whatever it is that you might struggle with. How are you doing in trusting God that even though you can't see it, that he is still in control? So how do we pray with faith? We have patience and we keep going. And I think patience goes through all the other things really that I'm going to to draw out. I think patience is the big theme throughout this whole chapter. But the next thing is to hold on to hope. So have patience in holding on to hope. James reminds us earlier in in this chapter that that Louis read that that Jesus is going to be returning. You know, if we can hold on to that truth that Jesus is going to be returning, be patient, he says, until the Lord's coming. See how the farmer waits for the land to yield its valuable crop, patiently waiting for the autumn and spring rains. You too be patient and stand firm because the Lord is coming near. So be patient because one day we know that things are going to be different. Jesus will return. He will restore all things. He will establish fully his kingdom. Be patient like the farmer in waiting until we see that God will do all the things that he's promised he's going to do. So we say whatever challenges that we're going through, hold on to this truth and pray. And when things are going well, Don't just forget about God. When things are going well, you know, let's do as it said in this passage, praise God. Let's remember to say thankful, to be grateful to God for the things that he is doing and praise him when there's the things that are going well. So being patient means not being manipulative, not grasping for control, but holding on to the confidence that God is enough for you. Holding on to the confidence that God is enough for you. We don't want to be practicing functional atheism. We don't want to be living as if God doesn't exist. God is at work now, and one day he will restore all things. So we trust God, and we pray, and we pray, and we pray. And if you live as if you don't believe God exists, well, that's dead faith. And we've been looking at this book of James to look at living faith. So how can we live as if God does exist, rather than areas of our lives maybe where we live as if God doesn't exist. Our challenge is to to start to to raise our sights and to, to live in a way that shows that Jesus is alive. Just going to give you a story of something in my life that happened a couple of years ago when I was given a prophetic word from God. And I think when people give us a word from God or, we, or God speaks to us in some way. He gives us things to encourage us, to help us on our journey. And you can see this picture here of me holding my two grandchildren. And um, mm-hmm. 
I don't know if I can say now what I was going to say. <laughs> I have to get used to that. <laughs> it was a hard journey, a hard journey of holding on to God, believing that he was going to come through. So for, for three years, Hannah struggled, my eldest, with um, trying for a baby, and after a year of trying, you know, she, she believed that God had spoken to her and that God was going to give her a baby. And then she became pregnant and had a miscarriage. So that was really tough. And Hannah was really struggling in terms of um, how, how she was feeling with her own mental health. And Hannah had been sent home and signed off from, from work. And uh, I went round to see her and then I came home and when I arrived home I got a text message from Angela who's on our team here and Angela said that she felt that God had spoken to her as she'd been out walking the dog and Angela had given her a picture or God had given Angela a picture of a woman holding a baby and Angela said to God you know well who's that woman holding that baby and God said to Angela that's that's Debbie so she, she sent me the message to encourage me and then my youngest daughter got pregnant. <laughs> so I'm then thinking, okay, God, what, what are you doing here? You know, is there going to be a way through for Hannah? What, what are you doing here? And then Angela told me that actually I was holding two babies. And she hadn't told me that originally. So we go on praying, go on trusting God, go on patiently praying, even though we didn't know how long it's going to take or how God was going to do it. And that, that was the picture of me holding both the babies after they've both been born. So I think God, what I'm really wanting to say is that God takes us on a journey where we need to have patience. We need to trust him and we need to go on trusting him. But sometimes he gives us things to hold on to. And that picture for me was the thing to hold on to, to encourage me to keep going. So as you reflect, reflect back over this last year, what choices have you made when things have been challenging for you? And where have they come from? Are those choices coming out of faith or coming out of fear? How can you pray with faith? And I'd say hold on to hope and remember that Jesus will be returning. And then the third thing is to hold on to the resurrection power. And in a moment, I'm going to have um, Laura come up here and join me. But the resurrection reminds us of God's power, that God can raise from the dead, that he can forgive. And last year, maybe we've seen the very worst of ourselves, as well as maybe in some areas, the very best of ourselves and of others. We've seen police officers take lives that they shouldn't in, in ways that they've acted that they shouldn't be acting. We've seen politicians making bad personal choices, and we still see that ha them d doing that. We have seen people make decisions that we disagree with. And, um, you know, there may be things that we've done here at St. Andrews that some of you would disagree with that you've found hard in decisions we've made. You may be aware of your own shortcomings and aware of areas in your own life that you've struggled where you feel that, that things haven't gone, you haven't done things in a way you wished you'd done them. And here in James chapter 5, in verse 14, he says, Is anyone among you sick? And the word sick here means helpless, meaning, is anyone among you unable to take effective action? The same words used in the Gospels to mean physical sickness, but when it's used in the epistles, it nearly always seems to mean spiritual limitation or disability. So when we're kind of, we're in a stuck place, when on our own we can't move forward and we need to call others to help us. And in... In verse 15 here, there's a different Greek word that talks, uh, that's used for sick, which is the word that talks about weariness and fatigue that's found in one other place in the New Testament, in Hebrews, where it says, Consider him who endured such opposition from sinners, so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. So what James seems to be saying is he's encouraging us, encouraging us when we've got stuck, when there are patterns of our behavior, patterns of sin in our lives, whatever it might be, unhelpful behavior that we're struggling to break to get help from others. When we, he's concerned about the pain that that causes in our own lives, how we get stuck and how we need others to come alongside us and to help us. 
We've been doing a, um, a STEPS course here at St. Andrews. I don't know whether you're, you're aware of that, but the STEPS course is where we're choosing to go on a journey with God um, and with others who are part of the STEPS course with us. And I'm going to ask Laura to come up here and just to share something about that because she was brave enough to come on the, the STEP course we ran. Great. Hello. So STEPS is looking at... Um, the same as on Alcoholics Anonymous, you, you have 12 steps. Someone has taken these 12 steps and um, written it as a, a course, as a Christian course, um, very biblically based. And um, we were doing that together, yes. finished in April. So, Laura, I'm just going to ask you, thank you for coming up here and joining me and asking a few questions. So, why did you choose to do the steps course? Yeah, so um, I, I'll start how we start every steps course. Um, my name is Laura, and then, oh, sorry. <laughs> It's a bit of an emotional day today, isn't it? <laughs> uh, whew. It's okay. Sorry. <sighs> okay. Uh, sorry. My name's Laura, and the unhealthy baby eyes I'm working on is the need for control. So, I've reached a point in my life where I had a lot of mental Let's and... Take a, take a breath. <laughs> <laughs> Um, yes, yeah, so I'd reached a point in my life where I'd, I, I had had a lot of uh, mental and physical destruction to myself. I had tried... Oh, this is ridiculous now. <laughs> um, yes, I had tried for years... Oh, good Lord, okay. I tried for years to, to get to a point in myself where I could tackle these, these mental demons and which turned into physical demons. So um, I had been trying to prepare myself for quite a long time. And I thought I'd got there on many occasions, but um, clearly my heart and my mind were not prepared enough. So the reason why I did this steps course is because I'd finally got to a point in my life where I knew I, knew I had to change. Um, it was just causing too much destruction to m myself and my family. Um, so yes, I this course came along at the right time for me. I'm so sorry. <laughs> I'm going to ask Laura another question and see, see how we do, do that one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so how have you seen, as you've gone through this process, as Laura said, going through the steps course is quite challenging. But yeah. amazing. I would say that, you know, at the end of the course, we were so encouraged, weren't we, to see how each person on it had really come forward and had found freedom. So, Laura, mm. how had you seen God's power at work in your life as you went through this process? Yeah, so I think it, it was very much, it's very much a week on week um, process. You know, it's not one of those you do, you do the week one and automatically, yes, I'm, I'm healed, or I'm saved. Um, I found that quite frustrating doing it week on week because I'm an all or nothing person. I, I like to see results straight away. So to have to actually take the time, do the work, um, go through the steps was a real challenge. But um, being able to do it as a group as well, um, the format is, is you get to speak, but you, you don't counsel each other. You actually just get to speak and, and say what you need to in that moment. Um, which is very liberating, and by, by just saying it to, in our, in our sense of screen, we didn't do it in person, it was, yeah, very liberating. And I think where I thought I would have the big changes, because we, there are videos and there are people who've done the course before who says, oh, I experienced a really big change this week. I built that expectation up in my mind that, oh, I'm gonna have a breakthrough this week. And they didn't happen on the weeks that I thought they would. They actually happened um, a lot later down the line, um, which, again, didn't help with what I was working on, is building up expectations in my mind. And, but God knew how to handhold me through that. And by the end of the course, I did find this peace that I have been longing for my whole life, which is, <laughs> I get so upset about it, sorry. Um, but it is it's putting in the hard work, and there's a... There's a verse in Hebrews, Hebrews 12, 11, that says, no discipline seems pleasant at the time, but painful. <laughs> Later on, however, it produces a harvest of righteousness and peace for those who have been trained by it. And I can honestly say steps was very painful, but 
it delivered me the peace that I've been longing for, and that's because of the grace of God. Well done. <laughs> yeah, thank you. So as Laura and I were chatting just before the service, you know, we're seeing how much actually in, in this passage in James reflects some of the things from um, the steps course. You know, you need the patience to go through the process. That the next point I'm going to bring out, which is helping one another, that we were journeying together and as we support one another and journey together. So James says, we don't need to struggle on our own. In verse 14, is anyone among you weary, fatigued by unhelpful behavior? That's where I've changed it slightly and put it, putting, changing the word over. Let them call the elders of the church to pray over them and anoint them with oil in the name of the Lord. And if you think of elders in the church, think of mature Christians that you trust. Who could you trust? Who could you bring, ask to come and pray for you? James mentions anointing that reminds us that it's God that heals. It's God that brings healing into our lives, that helps us to be set free from whatever it is that might be keeping us bound. And in steps, we're asking God to take away defects, the things that are there in our lives that are getting in the way, but asking God to help us to work on our unhelpful behaviors. So James is saying in verse 16, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. And we took that step on steps of actually confessing our sins to one another, which isn't something maybe we do very often, but it's so liberating that when you actually do it to feel that you've drawn a line under it and you can start to move forward. So James shows us how we can help each other to choose a kind and gentle friend, someone who will stand alongside you, someone who will listen to your deepest motivations, your jealousies, your frustrations, Someone who you can confess stuff that you wouldn't want to say to other people, but that you can confess your unhelpful behavior that you're stuck in. And then we can begin to experience forgiveness, freedom from the guilt and shame that God created us to be free and to be real with one another. Jesus says to Peter in um, Luke 22, he says, Satan has desired to sift you like wheat, but I have prayed for you. So how can we pray for one another and get other people to come and to pray for us. We can pray. How can we pray with faith? We can confess to one another and get other people to come alongside and help us. And the last one is to pray for those who've drifted away. Last words here from James. And often last words are lasting words, words to hold on to, words to take notice of. And James encourages us to seek and to bring back those who wander away from their faith. Those who've given in to um, unhelpful behavior in some area of their life, doing something that they probably know is not God's way. And it says, whoever turns a sinner from the error of their way will save them from death and cover over a multitude of sins. And death is that ultimate um, separation from God you know, at first, when we're aware of people who have drifted away or are drifting away, we don't need to say much. We just need to be showing them love, to be praying for them and go on praying for them, to be kind and gentle with them, to come alongside them, to be longing to welcome them back and restore, you know, reminded that God is full of compassion and love. There's a book that I've been reading at the moment called Growing Slowly Wise by a guy called David um, Roper. And um, it's an amazing book that just reveals more about the heart of God and the character of God, who God is, and, and the way in which God responds to people. And he says this. He says, God, it, God, he's talking about God being full of grace and that God understands human misery as no one else does. And he says, he knows those who've been trampled underfoot as children, he grieves those who are bending under a load of rejection and shame. He pities those whose hopes and dreams have been reduced to a flicker. It is this kindness that draws men and women to repentance. So it's a great way of thinking of when we find someone who's struggling, who's maybe walking away in their faith, that we can come alongside as Jesus would, as God would come alongside someone and that grace offers, always offers a new beginning, never turns away, always offers that new beginning. 
that God is able, that he can transform. So as we come to the end of um, looking at this passage, I think that, as I said, the thing to hold on to would be to hold on to being patient. Do you need to ask God to help you to be patient? Are there areas where you're struggling and need to ask him to, to grow patience in you? To hold on to hope that one day Jesus will return. To keep praying, knowing that God is powerful. To remember to, when you are happy about things, to be thankful and praise God for the good things. To find a way to get freedom, to confess, to forgive. As I mentioned earlier, you, know, you may feel let down by lots of people, by, maybe by the government, maybe by the NHS, by all sorts of things during the, this time, but to forgive. To forgive those who in some way have, um, have let you down or hurt you. And revival will come when ordinary Christians, revival will come when you and I live our lives as if Jesus is risen from the dead. You know, we don't need more Christian celebrities. We don't need more great talks. We need to live differently. We need to live as if Jesus is alive and to pray with faith. Yeah. If you'd like to stand, let's pray. So, Lord God, we just ask you to come by the power of your Spirit. Father, I ask you now that you'll just show each one of us what it is that you want us to, to hold on to, what it is the thing that you're saying to us today. Just take a moment and respond to God. Tell him what, what it is that you feel you need to say to him right now. Show us how we can live our lives as if Jesus is risen. How we can pray with faith. Is there anyone, Lord God, you're asking or any organization, anything that you're asking us to forgive? Do we need to find that person to come alongside us? Whether it's a friend who we can walk alongside and confess to, or whether it's um, asking someone that we see is more mature than us in the Christian faith to come and pray with us because there's areas we need their help with. And we thank you, Lord God, that we know that you are kind and loving and that you love and accept us just as we are, but you want us to move forward with you. Amen.